Welcome to Make More Marbles. My name is Brad Hart, and we're here to interview the game changers, the future makers, the co-collaborators and creators who are here to collaborate with one another towards a better future for all of us. Enjoy the show. We've got a great guest coming up for you right now. Welcome to Make More Marbles. My name is Brad Hart, and today I am thrilled. I've known Lila for quite a bit now. I've known, uh, I think we met in 2011, I want to say, on a trip to Africa. And Lila Jana is an incredible powerhouse of a lit young lady. She has done some incredible things in her time uh, from Google venture backed uh, NGOs that worked in multiple countries around the world, lifting people out of poverty. Over 45,000 people have been lifted out of poverty by her efforts to her latest uh, skincare and product line called Lakshmi, um, to her book, Give Work. She's just an incredible lady. And honestly, one of the, like, you, you meet some living saints in your life, I think, like really people that give everything they have and more. And Lila is one of those people. So I'm so grateful to have you on the show, Lila. Thank you for being here and for being who you are in the world. Thanks so much, Brad. It's an honor to be here. And uh, I'm really excited to share what we're up to. Absolutely. So why don't we ground it for people? If you could just share a little bit of the story of, where are you calling in from today, by the way? New York from the WeWork uh, Soho South office in Manhattan. <laughs> I've been there. Wonderful. Okay, cool. So the internet should hold up and everything should be solid. But, you know, if, if anything goes down, then I apologize in advance. But, um, yeah, give us a little bit of a grounding story. You know, let's, let's tell people how you got to where you are today. Well, um, when I was 16, I was like a nerdy Indian kid who was applying to every scholarship I could find because my parents... Um, didn't have the money for me to go to college. So I applied for this scholarship from, of all places, a tobacco company. And I got it. And it was like a $10,000 check in the mail. And then I felt kind of weird about using money from big tobacco to go to college. And I also wanted to have an adventure. So I figured out a way to use the money to go and do volunteer work and graduate early. And I found this like program in West Africa. I had never been to Africa. I had no connection there. But I found this program in Ghana, which seemed kind of interesting and exotic at the time. And so I thought, okay, I'll go and have an adventure. I'll do some service work. I won't use big tobacco money just to further my own you know, college education. And uh, I did that. I was 17 when I set off for Ghana. I graduated a semester early. And I worked at a school for blind kids in a rural part of the country and I lived in a village where people made probably a dollar fifty a day on average and saw global poverty up close for the first time and I was shocked I wasn't so much shocked I mean I was definitely shocked by the conditions in which people were living but I was mostly shocked by the fact that so many people there were really talented like I had fed into this myth that people are poor in places like rural Africa because they have zero skills and they're kind of sitting around hoping that we'll show up with water and food. <laughs> but I was really shocked to see that Ghana was much the same as my parents' home country, India, packed with really talented people who could read and write good English and who just didn't have job opportunities. And I thought to myself, this is so silly. You know, we think that um, we're going to save these poor, starving people by giving them aid, but what they really need is work. Mm. And the more I talked to low-income people and lived in their communities, I, I went on to, to spend a lot of time in, in poor parts of Africa and Asia, living and working in poor communities where people made a dollar or two a day. The more I talked to them, the more I realized what they really want from me is not to give them a handout, but to buy stuff from them. And so decided to make it my mission to give work to low-income people to help them move out of poverty. And I think the most ethical kind of relationship we can have um, with someone from a different background is through some kind of mutually beneficial interaction. And that's what trade really is, especially if we're paying people fair wages and we're trading on fair terms. And um, that's what my work is all about. I started Samasource now um, in September, it'll be 10 years. Congratulations, 10 years wow, 10 years. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, it's crazy. We're now uh, the largest data services company in East Africa. We employ nearly 2,000 full-time people. 
and uh, we uh, we became profitable last year as a nonprofit social enterprise, which is a really unique space to be in. But essentially, it means that though we uh, got started with grants and donations, we're now able to fund our own operations through business revenue. And what's most remarkable about Sana Source is that we move people permanently out of poverty. On average, we take them from about two dollars a day, which means no access to clean water, sanitation, healthcare, even food, um, and we move them to over eight dollars a day, which is moving someone to middle income in a place like Kenya. So, uh, really strong poverty reduction, and you know, everyone's heard the saying give a man a fish, fish, feed him for a day. Um, we're not only giving women and men fish, um, we're teaching them how to fish and we're showing them the path to fishing in the digital economy, which is a much more powerful way for people to earn income than in traditional fields like manufacturing or agriculture. So in so many ways, uh, Samasource is kind of paving a different path for people living in poverty. And then I started a, a second company, we talked briefly about that, Luxme, we became, this is what the products look like. Actually, I actually have one right next to me. Um, we're the first uh, fair trade and organic certified company to be sold nationwide at Sephora in the US. And uh, our mission at Luxme is very similar to Sana. It's to give work through the supply chain, but uh, instead of doing it through data services, we're doing it through sourcing uh, rare ingredients from low income places through supply chains that benefit women. So in this case, we harvest our raw ingredients from northern Uganda through women's cooperatives. And this is the, uh, the new packaging. It's got a fun oh, I love Africa. It. And packaging. thanks again for sending it over. I, I don't think I'm the target demographic, but I gave it to one of my friends and she was really thrilled and she said, thank you very much. <laughs> So, You're welcome. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing and, and apologies for, I still didn't know how to pronounce it. I was like, Lakshmi, Lakshmi? All right. Anyway. Um, the, yeah. The, the branding is wonderful. The, the, the mission I know is, is from a place of well thought out, you know, you, you approach things from a way that I think most people never will, right? How do we actually get to the root of the problem? and not just um, continue to play the game as it is, right? We want to change the game. And by giving people the ability to pull themselves out of poverty, you solve two problems, right? You're not just giving a hand out, which creates more of a victim mentality. You're giving a hand up. And that's what I really love. And, and it's been very successful, obviously. You know, you're self-sustainable. You've lifted 45,000 people out of poverty. You're bringing people into living wage. How do you see this continuing to expand and uh, balloon from here on out? So I think the biggest critique of social enterprise uh, businesses that, you know, help people measurably is that they don't scale, you know, and um, doing things the right way is more expensive and it takes longer and it's much harder than doing things the easy way. Like the default method for or the default mode for, uh, you know, for, for example, for skincare companies is to put horrific toxic fillers and chemicals and emulsifiers in your product and to ship it with the cheapest possible packaging that leaches, you know, BPAs into your, you know, into the thing that you're putting on your body. Um, and to use um, ingredients that not only don't do any good in the world, but actively do bad for your skin and your body, right? And if your kid ate the ingredient, you'd be worried. Um, that's the default setting. And it's, it's always easier to to kind of pursue a business in the default mode um, rather than to innovate. So for us, it's to, it's to show that we can scale true impact businesses. And my kind of guiding lights here are companies like Patagonia, which didn't happen overnight. You know, Yvonne Chouinard took 30 years plus to build that brand into what it is today. And I think that's sometimes what it takes to scale truly impactful businesses. The VC model of like, pumping tons of money into something and trying to get a 5x return in you know five years is um is really not applicable i think and frankly i don't think it's the way that long run value is created in the world i think um the most interesting problems are the ones that often take the longest to solve so for us it means scaling it means getting to from 2,000 workers to over 10,000 with sama i think we can build uh the biggest tech business in sub-saharan africa that's my interest. <laughs> and um, with Luxme, it's to scale into the largest social impact luxury brand in the world. We were called the Chanel of social impact by CNBC. 
and I want a business that grows to be as iconic as Chanel um, with you know beautiful packaging and beautiful design, but that actually does good in the world, um, not just looks good on a duty free counter. That's beautiful, Ilan. I share that mission very much. You know, I, I really see the potential for doing it right at scale, right? They always talk about do things that don't scale because that's what people really love. But I think there's a way to do both. I think there really is a way to bring what you consider to be the highest quality possible to the masses. And, and you know, you're certainly doing the right things. Uh, how has your leadership had to uh, evolve over these years in the way you interact with your business? How have you had to grow? Who have you had to bring in to help you get to these next levels? And what are you still uh, struggling with as a leader in your organizations? So, um, God, where do we begin? So I think a few things. One is like, I'm, I'm a very typical founder. I think there's like a certain type of founder, entrepreneur DNA. And um, typically, a typical founder <laughs> or, you know, someone like me is, is impatient. Um, uh, not always taking time for pleasantries. I think I can often not be the nicest person. Um, I don't, I feel like I'm always running out of time. So I don't invest enough time sometimes in, in relationships. Um, and I think one of the things I've learned is that I don't have to be good at all aspects of managing people or a team. I can hire people around me who are really good at the stuff that I'm terrible at. And so over time, I've really kind of looked to find people who are very different from me um, to bring into uh, the business and it's really helped us scale. So with Samasource, I brought in a CFO uh, who had a background at Oracle and I brought in a senior leader to help me run the Samasource business who has a really strong services background. Neither of them had nonprofit careers before. Um, they hadn't really done much work in this category, but they were really solid business people. And I also try to find no, I call them no people. <laughs> Um, I'm like a chronic yes person. I am constantly excited by possibilities. And so if left to my own devices, I will start lots of stuff. And I need people around me to help me whittle down the ideas that are most valuable, figure out the opportunities for the highest return on our investment and focus our time and energy because my natural tendency is to not do that. So luckily over the years, I've learned that about myself <laughs> and I'm really happy that I now have this amazing team of people who's, who are all really good at stuff that I'm terrible at. And together, I think we, we make each other better. Um, and I think it's a very hard thing, especially as a younger woman entrepreneur. I started Sama when I was 25 and I still feel like I'm not taken seriously half the time. Like I still feel like I have to bring in, more traditional looking members of my team when I'm fundraising, for example. Um, so I kind of had a chip on my shoulder and was a little bit defensive before about delegating and allowing people to really fully own what they were doing because I was always nervous that people wouldn't somehow see me as the CEO or that um, I wasn't going to be credible as the CEO if I didn't have full control over everything. I think one of the things you have to learn to scale something is that you really can't have full control over every single detail. Um, you have to kind of empower people and let them, you know, occasionally let them make mistakes if that's what needs to happen for, for them to take full ownership. Yeah, because ultimately you want people to be uh, aligned with the mission and they'll push it farther, faster than even you could ever, right? Because you only have 24 hours in the day. As talented as you are, you're one lady, right? At the end of the day, you need that team that's really driving as hard as you are um, in the ways that you're not as good, you know? And, and that's not, it's, uh, you know, it can't be everywhere at once. So they think the leadership lesson I'm getting here is have those no people around because I'm the same way. I'll start a million things. I'll make all the marbles. It's making the Mario marbles at the right time might be a better focus. Uh, so I appreciate that reflection. Um, Lila, you recently had, I don't know if you're willing to talk about it, but you recently had some health challenges. Would you kind of talk about that a little bit, where you're at, uh, what kind of led to that, and what you're changing about your lifestyle now to, to, um, to maybe readjust and go forward from here? Yeah, so I, um, I'm pretty athletic and I'm very active and I've always kind of regarded myself as like a trooper. I traveled alone in Africa since I was 17 and, you know, always kind of handled things. So I never really viewed myself as frail or that I could succumb to some sort of like, you know, cataclysmic health <laughs> issue. Yeah, by the way, I hung out with Lila for eight days. I came back with malaria. So <laughs> that's just oh, my I'm level. So sorry. 
<laughs> yeah. And I had it's malaria when I first went to bed. It's not fun. But, um, but, you know, it, like if you've gone, if you spend a lot of time in developing countries and you have things happen to you, you, you kind of develop a resilience. And at a certain point, you kind of get this feeling that you're invincible, which I certainly had. And I, had, I was kite surfing in late November in Brazil and like learning how to hydrofoil and feeling just like very, you know, this always happens to me. I get like crushed by the universe when I'm feeling most overconfident about my own ability. So I was like feeling like I was rocking the world. And then I had this book tour. So in addition to Sama and Luxmi, I thought it was a good idea to launch a book last year um, and then do a book tour around it, which I think in retrospect, I wish I had given myself a little bit more time to um, focus on the businesses and maybe push the book out a little bit later. So I kind of, um, showed up in Europe and was on book tour and had just gone to this kite surfing trip and was like fully amped and my body was just exhausted. And I ended up having, um, a random emergency procedure for an organ that twisted around itself, which is kind of a rare event. It can happen. And I had to go to the emergency room in Finland got this surgery and then left the hospital and flew to another, another city two days later and continued my work. I was fundraising at the time for one of my businesses. And then I had a fever and I kind of ignored it thinking it was just the flu. And over two weeks, this fever kept getting worse. And finally I was like, okay, I'll just go to the doctor and just do a blood test and see what's happening. And they, they like stopped me at the Munich hospital and were like, you are not allowed to leave. You have like a very severe bacterial infection from this surgery. And it just had spread all over my abdomen and I had to get two more emergency laparoscopic surgeries. Um, and the doctors, you know, when, when German surgeons are like worried, then you get worried because they're pretty, it's a pretty, uh, they're a pretty stock bunch. It's a culture that, <laughs> so like my German sir after like the, the third surgery I had within three weeks um my fever hadn't abated two days later and they had they were like pumping me full of different courses of antibiotics and they were like we don't know what's happening and you know um I started getting really panicked that maybe the antibiotics wouldn't work and I had some sort of crazy super bug in me that was going to be multi-drug resistant long story short finally the antibiotics started working the surgeries, they removed the infected stuff and it got better, but it was like a really shocking awakening, especially for someone who's always been pretty healthy and, you know, I never broke a bone. So I was in the hospital for three weeks and um, the blood results from the infection were so high at one point that like good friends of mine who are doctors were kind of scared and it really was a wake up call. First and foremost, I was so grateful that I'd been spent my life doing work that I really love. I felt like if I had like died in that hospital, at least I would have been able to say that I spent most of my time doing stuff that I think matters and that I really love. <laughs> yeah. But then the second thing it brought up was just, you don't have to run yourself into the ground. And I kept thinking in the hospital, like, wow, if this is really it, like all the stuff I want to do in the next five years for Sama, it's not going to happen. Mm. So you have yourself. So how have you changed um, your lifestyle? Like, and like, obviously, that was a very painful experience for you. And pain usually gets people to change. How are you changing your lifestyle as a result of that? Or are you changing your lifestyle as a result of that? I think I'm much more, I'm much more aware of what a gift good health is and just grateful every day that I wake up and I'm not waking up in the hospital in like tons of pain. And again, for someone who's never had that kind of thing happen before, it's an important kind of reminder. And I think that gratitude is in general a really healthy feeling. So that's one thing. The second is um, I think I'm a little bit less impatient. I think part of what led me to that situation is just chronic stress and I'm always I'm always impatient. I'm always feeling like I'm, you know, not hitting the objectives I set for myself and that we're not moving fast enough and that we should have been getting everything done yesterday. And that constant stress is really bad for your immune system. It's like bad for your body. It causes aging. It's bad in so many ways. And I think I beat myself up a little bit less. And I also try to remind myself that like, you know, it took Yvonne Chouinard a long time and Patagonia is like a 
freaking amazing company. Um, and so if it took him 30 years, maybe it'll also take me 30 years. So we don't have to do everything yesterday. In fact, if we try to do that, we might, you know, I might end up jeopardizing my health and then there won't be 30 years from now to keep building stuff. And, and, and there's a, you know, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I was just going to say like the math works out too, right? People talk about these, like, you know, you're trying to make 10 and 15 and hundred percent gains, but what if you could just make 1% gain and then realize that you're 1% and the way you move the needle, if you can do it consistently over time in, in a year, that's not 365%. That'd be addition. That's 3,778%. You can get 38 extra turns compounding every single year on top of each other, on top of each other, on top of each other, because you're already on that exponential part of the growth curve. You can make a phone call right now that can change the entire course of your business. Most people aren't accessible in that level. Most people don't have the access to the resources and connections that you have. So now it becomes less of how can I beat my head against the wall to make it grind and make it work. It becomes a question of who's the right person to now tap into that has the flow that I need to build my business to the level I want to build it to. And you know, that's my reflection is like, I just know that you know everybody and that your story and the way you present it, you will crush. I just know it's now the right people at the right time and not beating yourself to death. It's finding the right exact thing you need right now. That's the finesse. That's the next level, I believe. Yeah, and there's this saying, I'm just watching that Tony Robbins documentary and he says this saying that I love, which I repeat to myself, which is that most people overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in 10. And um, I think especially if you're trying to work on a big problem like poverty reduction or climate change, these are big entrenched problems and, and steady, slow progress that you continue and don't quit over a long period of time almost always beats these like flash in the pan, you know, um, seemingly overnight success stories or attempts at that. So I wrote this post recently about the motto for Jeff Bezos' space company, which is step by step ferociously. And I read the story also recently of an Arctic explorer who was um, very inspired by Ernest Shackleton, who was a famous, sorry, Antarctic explorer in uh, the early part of the last century. And um, it talks about how he eventually died, um, but how he made several expeditions in the South Pole that were really remarkable as a one-man solo expedition, you know, in the most treacherous part of the world. And those types of expeditions, you also have to approach as a marathon and not a sprint. You can't like burn yourself out too quickly. You have to you have to ration your food. You have to think about making incremental progress day by day and getting through the tough, you know, low points. Um, and I think there's such a metaphor there for entrepreneurship. Well, it's like the, the Grand Canyon is a trickle over millions of years. Yeah. You know, just water over rocks over, over a long period of time that'll get there. And we don't have forever. We don't have millions of years, but you can do quite a bit in a decade. And you have. You know, I mean, you're still in your thirties and you're still, you still have a huge career ahead of you. Don't jeopardize it. That's all I'm saying on behalf of everybody, you know, like that's just a friend talking, but we want to see you continue on in the way you're continuing on, but not burn out in the process, right? You're a bright shining star. We all believe it. And I know, you know, it, uh, we want to see you have many more years of success, not just for you, but for everybody who's lives you impact. Cause I know you're, you're not somebody who thinks of themselves first. So, um, do it for everybody, but do it for you too. And we love you. <laughs> uh, Lila, okay, so changing gears. I know you have a limited amount of time. Um, I want to ask you the question I always foist upon everybody on the Make More Marble show. So this is all about collaboration and winning more through collaboration than we ever could through competition. That's the whole Make More Marbles philosophy. The way we do that is by helping each other connect to the resources, opportunities, people, and systems, I call it crops, that they need to move their mission forward faster. So what are some of the ways that myself, my team, anybody listening can help you move your mission forward faster? Probably the number one way is just to spread the word. Um, if you share um, some of this message and just use the hashtag give work, um, we're really on a mission to shift thinking and philanthropy and in social good away from, oh my gosh, how sad, here are these starving people in Africa towards a model um, that's more about solidarity. That's like, okay, if we wanna help these people um, that you know maybe have, were born into poverty or have less material wealth than we do, the best way to help them is to 
kind of view them as producers, as equals on a level playing field and buy from them. Um, I think if you care about the plight of women in the developing world, um, if you care about violence against women, buy from women. Don't patronize them <laughs> by just giving them a handout. Um, so that's the most powerful, I think, thing every, anyone can do is, is share. And um, sharing through social networks is what builds movements. So the more we can spread that message of giving work, the better. I love it. Thank you, Lila. And then, of course, buy our products. You can buy my book <laughs> and tell your friends about it. It's on Amazon. I've bought a couple copies for friends. It's an amazing book. Thank you for writing it. And um, you can check out Luxme, which is lxmi.com, I believe. And yeah. samasource.org. Uh, it's S-A-M-A-S-O-U-R-C-E.org. And uh, Lila, you're doing it right. I, I just want you to make sure you don't burn out in the process. That's all. It's just me talking from a from a place. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and any way we can help, please. Uh, what's the best way to reach out if somebody has a connection for you or a way to do that? Uh, they're going to share on social, hashtag give work, uh, vote with their dollars, most importantly, empower the women that, that are being abused or otherwise mistreated because they don't have economic freedom and solidarity. Uh, we appreciate that. And then, uh, yeah, how they reach out if they have comments, feedback, or, or a lending hand or listen to this and they're inspired to connect you to somebody that can really help them move your mission forward faster. Yeah, the best way is through Facebook. I'm just at Lila Jana on Facebook and I read those messages um, at least once a week. So, right on. That would be the thank best. You, and mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for being here on behalf of everybody in the Make More Marvels community. It's great to see you. And, I'm glad you're well and doing your thing. And New York City is a great place, so enjoy yourself. Thanks so much. Look forward to connecting you again soon, Brad. All right. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to the Make More Marvels podcast. For more tips, hacks, and strategies to create an amazing, abundant life in your health, wealth, and relationships, whatever that means to you, head on over to makemoremarbles.com. Check out our cool explainer video about what we're about and join our community of entrepreneurial game changers. We want to help you level up your life in every possible way. And don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play, wherever you listen to your podcasts, and please do leave a review. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on the next podcast.